Matthew chapter 5 verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousnesses or the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, let's make that statement clear. If you're not entering into the kingdom of heaven, hell will be your home. I don't know what happened to the church in America that every time you mention people going to hell or God forbid you preach a whole message about people going to hell, you instantly feel a certain percentage of the oxygen leave the room. There's not much oxygen in hell, I'll tell you that. Uh, you know something? Uh, Christ had more to say about hell than he had to say about heaven, I think. Uh, but uh, th there are but two destinations, and don't let anyone tell you that there's a third or fourth option. Right. You need to determine today where you're going. Amen. It might not seem important where you're going right now because you're not there yet, but in the day that you open your eyes in a place of eternity, and there's no going back, and there's no changing your address, it'll be important where you're at. There's a question of righteousness today. There's a question of righteousness that has everything to do with where you're going and how you live between now and then and what kind of existence you'll have from now until eternity. True righteousness. I'm not talking about the righteousness that has been defined to you by a group or a denomination or by a church or by a pastor or by some figment of your imagination or by your perception of who you are as a person or by what your conscience tells you or by what your heart has to say. Your heart is desperately and deceitfully wicked and God asked the question through the prophet Jeremiah, who can know it? Who can even know the depths of the heart? Your heart is lied to you about righteousness. Jesus tells you the truth about righteousness. Now I tell you it's honestly difficult for me to talk to you about righteousness because as I, as I take the Sermon on the Mount and I tear it apart and I tear it into little bite-sized pieces just like I do for my kids when I feed them. I tear it into little pieces so they don't choke on it and so that they can get every bite and not leave anything out and so that they can handle it. As I do that and I tear it into bite-sized pieces first so I can handle it and then so others can handle it, I realize that there is so much that is incriminating in my life and I might have a sneaking suspicion that it's incriminating in your life. And as I look at every word and I take it and I twist it and I turn it and I take it inside out and I look at it and, and I look within. And I look at the Word of God as a mirror because the Word of God never lies. It's not a trick mirror. It doesn't distort anything. As I look at that, I see the truth and it's sometimes difficult. It's sometimes hard to swallow. But I want you to do that with me today. I want you to look in the mirror and I have asked God, even as, as recently as sitting right there in that pew, right here, that God would remove anything and everything that stands between he and I. Not that I doubt my salvation, but because I want to stand here clean in front of you. And that I cannot ask for an anointing power from another world when there is anything between him and I. I feel bad that I have the need to, to say that and to make it known, but I have done that. And sometimes I don't pray when I get up here before I preach because I've already got my praying done. But he's talking to us about true righteousness. He says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Understand just a quick summary of what he's talking about. He is making it known there's a difference in my ministry and the ministry of the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in the synagogues and in the temple. Mainstream religion was not offering what Jesus was offering. He had a different agenda. And because he had a different agenda, 
He was criticized and accused of things that he was not guilty of. Hear me out and understand. Because he had a different agenda than those that claimed to be teachers and scholars of the law, the Old Testament. Because of that, he was accused of being one that tears down and invalidates and challenges the Word of God. What they didn't truly know and understand is that not only was he not tearing it down, not only was he not challenging it, but he was the author of it. He was the one that the law and the prophets foreshadowed and predicted and prophesied and pointed to. And everything in the Old Testament points to the New Testament. And there is a path watered with tears that leads from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the cross. Jesus is making it known it is not my agenda to tear down and invalidate the law and the prophets. It was his agenda to tear down and invalidate an invalid ministry that did exactly the thing that they were accusing him of doing. See, see he says, I didn't come to, to, to challenge it. I didn't come to destroy it, but I came to fulfill now, there were men teaching and, and so-called preaching in that day and at that time that I'm sure claimed and, and portrayed themselves as ones that could fulfill this law, but they made themselves better than Moses. Moses couldn't fulfill it in so much as to even abide by it long enough to make it into the promised land without God having to snuff him out and take his life. Don't forget that, that the primary spokesman and the primary penman for the law, not all the prophets, but, but the foundation of the law was given to mankind by God through Moses. And even he couldn't keep it. Even he died prematurely at the, at the ripe old age of 100 and something years old. Still premature death because of his sin. They portray themselves as people that can fulfill something that even Moses couldn't fulfill. That Abraham couldn't fulfill. The one that they boast of being their father. That the prophets that, they, that their fathers killed, they themselves couldn't fulfill. There's a trail of failure also all the way to the cross. Because everything before the cross failed to bring true righteousness. Even the law of God couldn't bring true, life, true righteousness. Not that the law was weak, but that the flesh is weak in its ability to satisfy the law. The law was never given to bring righteousness. It was given to expose the lack of righteousness in our lives. Jesus says, I'm the first one that has ever come along that could fulfill this law because it's my law, because it was written by me, it was given by me, it was given about me. And when you've seen the Father, you've seen me. And the righteous perfection of God is demonstrated by the law that is unobtainable to your flesh. Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy that. I'm the only one that has ever been able to fulfill it. And I'm the only shot at true righteousness that you have because your flesh cannot fulfill it. And it's going to have to come through the law. Righteousness will have to be brought in accordance to the perfect standard of God. And Jesus is, in a sense of the word, looking around, saying, who can fulfill it? Whoever can fulfill it will follow you. Jesus says, I can fulfill it. He could fulfill the law. He could drink the cup of wrath. He could rise victorious over death, hell, and the grave. He could do everything he said he could do. He's unchanged today. He's still offering true righteousness. But how does it come? It does not come through those that uphold a false standard that they themselves cannot satisfy. Have you ever noticed that some of the people that fall the hardest morally are the ones that preach the hardest. The ones that have the highest, most unobtainable standard are often the ones that fall off of that pedestal. Why? Because there are those that trust in the power and the energy of the flesh to fulfill what in their mind is the expectation of God because they have adjusted 
for their carnality. They have allowed in their mind for certain exceptions and for certain uh, tendencies of the flesh and certain things that they have compensated in their own mind that this is not a big deal and this is a little sin and this is a big sin and this is where my boundaries are and I might do this but I won't go past this point. And they've taken this mess and, and made this big bowl of unrighteousness and packaged it in such of a way and put a big pretty religious bow on it and offered it to God and said, here you go, God, this is the best I can do and I think it measures up pretty well to everyone else. Nicodemus measured up pretty well to everyone else until he met Jesus. But Jesus, said, Jesus tells us that those that uphold true righteousness will not only enter the kingdom but they will be greatly honored in the kingdom. So just by implication the, the statements that he has made implies that many if not all of those that were religious leaders at that particular time were bound for hell. Because not only did they, did they trust in their ability to keep something that they could not keep not only that but they made allowances for the fact that they could not keep it. Let's read on, and I'll, and I'll tell you what exactly I'm trying to say. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. So there is an absolute standard. It has to be absolutely perfect. The best you can do is just fine, so long as it's absolutely perfect, absolutely all the time. Oh, and also, by the way, it absolutely always has to have been always absolutely perfect. So if you ever messed up in the past, you're invalidated. One shot. Perfection is something that there are no second chances at. No second opportunity. No way to overcome your past when it comes to perfection. You can overcome your past in a lot of things, but perfection is not one of those. He said that, that one jot or one tittle would in no wise pass from the law. The jot is simply this. It's the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So if he's talking about the Old Testament, it's written in Hebrew, and so the smallest letter... Everything from the smallest letter to the tittle, which is literally a little horn, which is something like a hyphen, which is a mark used in the Hebrew language to distinguish one letter from another similar letter, and so therefore it provides clarity as to what is being said. How many knows that one number in your phone number makes all the difference? How many knows that, that one letter sometimes changes the complete meaning of a word? Jesus is saying down to the detail, down to the seemingly insignificant, the law of God will be upheld and it will never pass away until it is all fulfilled. And so from the jot, which is literally the iota, down to the punctuation, Jesus says it will all be upheld. And there was a group of people preaching and teaching that did not have that standard. Not only could they not fulfill it and, and not accept it, they were not... I said that wrong. Not only could they not fulfill it and could they not satisfy it, but they were not even honest about what it was. But let, let me read on. I'll make it clear. He said, Whosoever shall therefore break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. I, I had to scratch my head about that because it sounded to me like he was saying, if anybody commits a sin, if anybody fails to be perfect, he'll be the least in the kingdom of heaven. And I thought, well, that doesn't line up with the gospel of grace because I know that that does not lie within me and that's not possible even though I'm saved, even though I'm in the process of being sanctified. I'm never in this flesh going to come to the point that I never, ever break a commandment. It's, it's not going to happen. It's not. So, so I thought, how does that line up with the gospel of grace that says that Christ has fulfilled it and I trust in him and, and I trust in what he has done. And so I obey him and I follow him and I let him guide me into a law of liberty. I thought, how does that match? But I began to dig a little deeper and that word break does not simply mean to transgress against. It means more than that. It means to dissolve or to make void. 
What he's alluding to is the practice of the Jewish teachers to take laws that they thought were unobtainable or that they thought were insignificant or that they thought weren't as important as other laws that they could find some way to monetize and profit from. And they made them lesser. Oh, when it comes to giving to the temple, oh, those are big commandments. When it comes to offering sacrifices, those are big commandments. We can find ways to make money off that. But when it comes to matters of the heart, when it comes to unseen things that only God can determine, when it comes to things that are inconsequential from a carnal perspective, they took those laws and made them small and, and kind of invalidated them and created this, this very legalistic system of little sins and big sins and for the worst of motives. And so Jesus is making an indictment to them. He said this, if anyone takes and dissolves or invalidates or takes the, from the significance of even the smallest of commandments and teaches other people to believe that same way, they shall be called the least in the kingdom. And so even that was not an absolute death sentence. Because if I'm the least in the kingdom, I'm, I'm still in the kingdom, right? If I'm the least in the kingdom, am I in the kingdom? So, so even that was not eternal damnation. But he goes a step further. He goes a step further than that. All the way down at verse 20, he says, I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So listen, what he's saying is what they are doing is even worse than invalidating certain laws and elevating others. What they're doing is even worse than legalism. What they're doing is even worse than denying the importance of part of the law while they elevate other parts of the law to monetize it and try to take advantage of it. He's saying they are even far gone, farther gone than that spiritually. They're even more guilty than that. They're even more guilty than someone that simply takes and fails, fails to rightly divide the word. He's saying, follow them if you want to go to hell. Follow them because they not only invalidate part of the word of God, but they don't stop there. They, maybe that was the beginning place. But these people have gone to the point that not only do they invalidate parts of the Bible while they elevate others, but they've even made up their own laws that are, that are tradition and literally added them to it and touted these laws as if they were laws. That's about enough about them. That establishes the groundwork for why Jesus is saying what he's saying. He's saying, I have not come to destroy the law like they have accused me of doing. I have come to defend the word of God against them. And I have come to do the very thing that they cannot do. And that is, so, that is to satisfy the perfect demands of holiness that God has placed upon mankind. And revealed that through the law. Yet in the mind of God he knew that man could never do this. That's why the law is called our schoolmaster. The law teaches us what we are who we are, how we are, and who God is. I am convinced that a great deal, maybe a majority, I don't know, but I, I could say with authority a great deal of people that have been raised in fundamental churches, that sit on church pews. I'm not saying whether they've been saved or not, but I am saying that they have never had that Isaiah chapter 6 experience of seeing God high and lifted up. Because the result of that is you see yourself for who you are. And you would have to say with Isaiah, you'd have to say with Paul, you'd have to say with me and everybody else that ever looked in the mirror, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. What an incriminating statement. 
What a debasing, degrading thing to have others think about you. Well, what a thing for God to know about you. How many has ever seen the glory of God? We, we have our little preacher's class on Thursday night for just a handful that come to try to encourage one another and, and we try to learn some things together. And there was, uh, th there was some statements made about preaching under the anointing. And I got to thinking about that, that within the next 10 to 20 years, every, nearly every preacher, if not every preacher that I know, that I look at as an example of an anointed man of God that knows what the glory is, will be dead and gone and passed off the scene. It's a, it's, a, it's a strange thing for me to look around now and see preachers coming along that are 10 and 12 years younger than I am, but I'm seeing that. And you know what? They've never even seen the glory of God. They've never even seen a move of the Holy Spirit that comes and incriminates you when you're not right and comforts you when you are. They've never even seen that, that move of God that's spontaneous that comes and all of a sudden it's just like the walls turn into mirrors. And all of a sudden, there's nowhere to hide. And all of a sudden, I'm exposed before God and man. And the Word of God has spoken. And though others may not know, there's really nobody here but me and Him. Jesus is speaking of a, of a true righteousness that transcends and far surpasses what the mainstream religion was doing. Those that couldn't handle it, so they watered it down. Those that couldn't deliver, so they just changed the standard. Jesus said, I have come to fulfill. I have come to deliver. I have come to uphold. I have come to demonstrate to you the perfect standard of God and to do it on your behalf. And he was just like, uh, you remember what he said to Jerusalem? How often would I have gathered you unto myself like a hen gathers her chickens? That's what he does. He hides us under his wings. He, he hides us within the cleft of the rock just like God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock. Jesus is the rock of my salvation. And they, they broke him on the cross. And it created a hiding place for me. Just like, just like Noah and his family entering into that ark. The ark of safety. They were safe from the judgment of God on the outside. And they were pitched within and without. That means they were sealed by the atonement. That the judgment of God was not coming in. Because God shut the door. And God hid them in a safe place. Not because they were good. Not because they were righteous. But because somebody found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The unmerited favor of God given to man. Because at least there was a desire to be right. And this generation today says, how wrong can I be and be okay? How far can I get and God uh, be happy with me? How much can I get away with? And the apostle to the Gentiles says, commands us to flee from even the appearance of sin. To flee from fornication. To flee from things. The spiritual. Because you can't feed both at the same time. And all of this seems necessary before you even have a discussion about true righteousness. Because how do you talk to people about true righteousness when, when the world is trying to figure out how to get away from it? And God forbid, a, a, a great deal of the church is trying to figure out how to get away from it and still be Christian. True righteousness, how does it come? We talked about how it doesn't come. That's the hard part. Here's the easy part. How does it come? I see three words I want to tell you as quick as I know how. I, I kind of went from verse 18 to verse 20. I did that on purpose. Now I'm going to go back to verse 19. Whosoever therefore uh, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. That's where I stopped in verse 19. Now I'm going to give you the second half. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Here in these verses 17 through 20, he has told us what righteousness is not, and he's telling us how to have the real thing. 
I see three words that are important. The first word I see is all the way back in verse 17. It's the first word of our text. Say it out loud. Think. First thing he has to say is this. You're thinking wrong. You think something about me that is not true of my character. It's not true of my agenda. You better think right. You'll never believe right. You'll never live right. You'll never feel right. You'll never be right until first off, you think right. I'm not talking about this intellectual Christianity that based on, that's based on your understanding and your scholarship and your education. That's not the kind of thinking I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of thinking that says the information that you believe about who he is and what he came to do is correct. I can't skip the initial part of understanding who he is and then from there seeing myself for who I am and understanding why he came and understanding what the purpose of his blood is and his atonement. I can't skip that part and ever call myself a Christian. I can't have true righteousness and it not affect my way of thinking. Because think about it, before I do anything, before, before the words come up my throat and out my mouth, before that signal goes to my hands to tell them to do a certain thing, whether it be a good thing or a bad thing, before that signal goes from my brain to my feet to make me go certain places, you name it, there's nothing happening in your life that does not start with a thought. On Wednesday nights for the last four weeks, we talked all about the book of Philippians that tells us as Christians how to think. Thinking is knowing. What do you know? I hate to, to burst your bubble, but I'm not saved by how I feel. Thank God I'm not saved by how I feel. Can I just tell you, I don't feel so good. I'm not saved by how I feel. In other words, I couldn't be saved and not know it. In other words, I couldn't be saved and then get to heaven and say, Oh, well, I knew there was a God out there. I just didn't know who he was. It's necessary to know that, the, that God the Creator has a son and he came. This is why we send money to missionaries. This is why we go and tell the gospel. If, if it was only necessary to desire to do good... We could just skip the gospel and we could save them by ignorance. Well, don't tell them the gospel so they won't be accountable for it. No, you'll be accountable for it. You had better know the gospel. You had better know what that word means. You had better know how to define it. You had better know what it implies for humanity. Think. Some of you might not think you're too bad. Some of you might not even think you're a sinner. Some of you might think that all this is irrelevant. Some of you might think... 
that God will accept the best that you can. And some of you might really think that you're going to live it forever. And some of you might really think that you'll stand in judgment. And God will say, I understand. I don't know what you think, but I know what you need to think. You need to think that Jesus came to fulfill the law. Which implies that you think that he is perfectly sinless. You had better think that he's not just any other man. You had better think that he came to do the impossible. And you had better think that he came not only to fulfill the law, but to offer that fulfillment to mankind. That was the purpose of the cross. See, this isn't the only time. But the only time that Jesus talked about thinking, do you remember in the book of Matthew chapter 16? Jesus one day wanted to know, what do you guys think about me? Talking to his disciples, what do you guys think about me? Who say men that I am? Well, some say you're Elijah the prophet, and reincarnated, come back down. You're the fulfillment of that prophecy that, that, that I'll, I'll send you the, the spirit of Elijah. And, but some people say you're John the Baptist. So they've never seen you both at the same time. So they think that uh, they killed John the Baptist, and then he came back from the dead, and you're him. Some people think you're, you're one prophet or another. and Some people th even think you're the Messiah. Then he asks a more important question. Who say ye that I am? Peter's got a big mouth and a bad temper. And he's kind of ignorant. And he's kind of socially unacceptable. And I love the guy. I think he's my twin brother. But once in a while. Once in a while he was right. Once in a while he, he didn't sit around and think about it. And, and once in a while, he just responded when he knew it was right. And he spoke up and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter is saying, here's what I think. And this time Jesus commended him, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. He's saying, Peter, you think the right way. That's the first step to real righteousness. You have to think the right way. You have to have a realization of who he is and who you are. That he is sinless and you're a sinner. You have to think that way. You can't skip that step. And then I see another word. I see the word do. That was in verse 17. Think. In verse 19 I, I see do. But whosoever shall do. Do what? Do the works of righteousness. Follow what the Bible said. When they said the law and the prophets, they weren't just talking about do's and don'ts. They were talking about the whole Bible, what was known to them at that time. The Old Testament. The prophets. Hey, the, the Psalms. They say, I will hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against God. The Proverbs that tells us a thousand different ways how to be wise and how to be a fool. The prophets that tell us to be on the lookout for the coming of Christ. For them, it was the first coming. For us, it's the second coming. I mean, the, the entire Old Testament, it was a complete Bible. I could preach Jesus and never open the New Testament. What is the do? Do what the Word of God has said. But we live in a time that people feel validated and affirmed just by admitting that they're not doing it. How many preachers have you heard in your lifetime that say we should be doing this and we should be doing that and we ought to do that and we ought to be ashamed that we don't do it and everybody says amen and then we all leave and go out the door. Nobody intended to do anything about it. But we feel so much better that we was a big enough man, a big enough woman to stand up and admit that we're not doing it. And God says, ha ha. What did James say? James had a lot to say about doing. James chapter 1 verse 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You are deceived if you think that it makes you less accountable instead of more when you admit that you're not doing what you should be doing. When you stand before God, maybe He'll play that on the screen and let all of humanity, past, present, and future, see that you knew that you were living in disobedience. But we, it starts in childhood. Teach our kids, thank you, honey. 
for being honest. You telling me you stole that cookie. Daddy told you not to. And then go on with no consequence. I'm so proud of you. You can sin and admit it. Now go conquer the world. Go out there and do everything wrong you can. Just admit at the end of the day that you did it. How ridiculous. Well, it's stupid. Come on. Do. Think and then do. Do what? Do the works of righteousness. The fact that I cannot be perfectly sinless at all times is not a free pass for me not to do what I can do. It's not a free pass for me to dismiss that voice of the Holy Spirit that comes in conviction that says, don't do that. You, we don't need a whole lot of deep theology and, and $10 words. Just do what you know. Truth, righteousness implies thinking correctly and then acting on what we think. I didn't say that doing will take you to heaven, but people on the way to heaven will do. Sometimes do means repent, which means don't do. And then it gets quiet and, and people think, well, I thought this was, a, this was a salvation by grace. I thought this was not of works lest any man should boast. Well, you still can't boast. <laughs> you have to do what's right and you're still not allowed to boast. <laughs> They're thinking, man, let's get this over with. Think and do. Do you know that the word believe is something you do? It's the act of believing. And if I be I'd move on if you, uh, you didn't act like you were dead. I mean, I, I feel like I have to keep pushing on the sore spot for some reason. I, be believing is doing. And I don't believe I should be doing. I mean, I don't, I don't believe that God is serious about it and that, that God is true in what he's saying if I then don't respond. It ought to translate to a difference in the life. That's all I'm trying to say. Think. Do. And what's the third one? Teach. Teach. What I'm telling you today is that righteousness is found in three parts of your body. This coming week, you need to add these three things you know those people on, on YouTube that tell you what to add to your workout regimen this coming week? I'm going to give you three parts of the body you need to work out. Start with your mind. Think correctly. Then go to your hands and do. But then the third place your righteousness is found is in your mouth. It's in our mouth. Teach. This invalidates the idea that says, well, just live right in front of them. You don't have to preach to them. You don't have to tell them all about Jesus. Just live right in front of them. That'll be plenty good enough. Try that in judgment. Try that at the... <clears throat> I'm talking to the Christian. <clears throat> Try that at the judgment seat of Christ where you give account for the deeds done in the body, whether they be evil or good. And he says, I called you to be a soul winner. Or he, t he, t he tells you a name of an individual that he gave you a burden for and gave you an opportunity. And you said, I know I didn't give them the gospel, but I lived right in front of them. But we, what are we begotten by? By the word. Right. It's funny how people talk about church and preachers and religious stuff. You know what? The, they, they classify preachers into two categories basically they say oh boy that preacher he's a fireball he's a fireball that's that's one classification then the other one is well he he's all right but he's a teaching preacher he's okay but he, he tells us what god said <laughs> give me the fireball you might get the fireball it might not be the one you want you know something to teach means to impart information. Hey, Ricky, when I come sit down in your Sunday school class, brother, teach me something. 
Tell me what God says. If you want to get excited about it and jump up and down while you do it, I like that even better. But teach me what God said. Your children, they may not know how to put it into words. They may not be saying it explicitly, but they're looking up at you and saying, Mama, Daddy, teach me what God says. Sometimes they ask questions that we just don't know how to answer. Jesus said, think, do, teach. Now he was talking primarily about those that taught in the temple and in the synagogues. Those that stand before people and have a precious opportunity for a few minutes to speak to them. Teach them what God said. Don't teach them what he didn't say. And, don't, and especially don't teach them that he didn't say things that he did say. Teach them that. James, again, he's, well, he's right along lines with his brother Jesus. James chapter 3, he said, Brethren, be not many masters, that means teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. A sobering thought is that I'll stand before God and I'll take every word I have ever said in this desk with me. And if I'm wrong, everybody will know. And if I'm wrong, there might be, not, not many, but there might be just a handful that go the way I say to go. And if they go wrong, their blood will be on my hands. James says, don't even desire to have a, a large group of you to be teachers. You might get what you ask for. You might not want what you get when you get it. But, uh, but I'll end with this thought. Probably more relevant for you, most of you. Teach those that are within your sphere of influence, especially those of your house, your children, your grandchildren, those that come to you on the job and they ask you questions about the Bible and sometimes it takes you off guard and you don't know what to say. And you say, let me get back with you. Why don't you be ready and not have to get back with them? Why don't you get off Facebook a little bit and get in the Word of God a little bit? Why don't you, when you come home and you're just dead tired, instead of sitting there watching TV until you collapse and, and then you have to get up and go to the bed because you done fell asleep in the recliner? Why don't you open up? I saw you look at Michael. That's so funny. Why don't you open the Word of God for a little while? Teach. Whoever, whosoever shall do these things and teach them. See, well, by the time we get to this part, we're not talking about getting into the kingdom. When you get to this part, we're talking about being great in the kingdom. You know, uh, some of you think, well, I don't care about being great. I just, praise God, I just want to get there. Let me tell you something. You're going to be there a long time. And you're going to have a long time to think. When you look around, you see other people with crowns and jewels and treasures laid up in heaven. And for all eternity, you get to look at that and think, well, I wish I would have took advantage of the time on the earth that I could be greatly honored in heaven too. I didn't say it. God said it. Jesus said that whosoever shall do and teach them. What? What's the them? Even the least of these things. The same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Ricky, come get us a song of invitation. Uh, I love you. I want us to be truly righteous. <clears throat> I want us first to seek God for righteousness that we cannot obtain outside of Christ first for salvation, and then from there. I want us to think and do and teach. Don't, don't, you shouldn't have to tell your children, do as I say, not as I do. They'll never forget that. Mama, Daddy told us we ought to live right and honor the Lord and talk right and think right. But he didn't do right. Stand together this morning. Are you, are you thinking and doing and teaching? <clears throat> do you have true righteousness or do you have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof? Do you speak and profess something that's not operating effectively in your life to the point you feel like a hypocrite when you speak of it, that's, that might be a good sign. You're not thinking and doing and teaching. 
you might even be unsaved. So 